Peace and blessings, everyone. My name is Amina Lay, and welcome back to our podcast, Unveiling Love, Stories of Community and Social Change. This is a space where community leaders and artists discuss their defining moments that shape their effort in their work in defending love, their work in the community, cultivating community resources, racial solidarity and safety for all. This is a shifting of a narrative. We've seen a lot of negativity on the media and the news, but we wanna highlight folks that are really doing the work, the positive work in our community. This podcast is part of our Love Over Fear Oakland campaign organized by our family at, Inter uh, at Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity. Uh, last episode, we had our executive director, Reverend Deborah Lee, who spoke about the importance of faith in social justice movements and how important it is to build racial solidarity during these times. I am so excited to continue this conversation with our guest today, a freedom fighter, educator, MC, poet, author of Black Boy Poems, Black Boy Poems Curriculum, he is the founder and director of Freedom Soul Media Education Initiatives. He is definitely transforming the world of education. Please welcome my friend, my family, Tyson Amir. Welcome, Tyson. Right on, right on. What's up with it, Sister Amina? How you doing? Wow. I see a couple of my homies hopped on. That's what's up. I see my boy, Jason. I saw my, my boy, Big, Big B. On there, that's what's up, hey, y'all, I'm Jews. Yeah. But nah, Sister Mina, thank you. Thank um, you for the invitation. Thank you for, uh, for real, like the inspiration in terms of the work that you've been doing in the Bay Area, in Southern California, you know, representing with the nation of Islam, extremely strong, and um, I appreciate it. It's just good to be here. It's gonna be good to talk. Let's make it happen. Oh, oh man, it's, it's an honor to have you, you know, when I, first heard about this campaign and how it's built on, you know, just highlighting racial solidarity and bringing safety into our community. I automatically thought of you, like you're one of the first people I thought of because we're doing uh -huh. this amazing work in education in really working with our youth, you know, right where it starts. So I want folks to get to know a little bit more about you. Right on. Can you share um, a little bit about your yourself and how FSMEI, Freedom Soul Media Education Initiative, got started. Right on. I appreciate it. So I am Bay Area product, extremely proud of that. I'm from San Jose, I'm from the east side, 408, born and raised there. But the time that I came up in the Bay, you know, a lot of folks who, who may have moved to California, moved to the Bay Area recently, what you see is not what it was. Change is a constant reality in our lives. So, but like it was a different thing. So being from San Jose meant something different in the eighties and nineties going into the early two thousands. If you was from Oakland, if you was from the city, if you was from East Palo Alto, you was from Richmond, we were a little bit more, I think, segmented in our thinking, like where you were from really, it, it, of course it means a lot because that's the sort that produced you. But like we had more uh, geographical conflict based on that. Like when folks from the town would come to, to San Jose, you know, we might get into some some low conflict or folks from the, from San Jose coming to the city or, or Oakland, it was different. But now I feel like we have matured in our thinking about the Bay Area geographically. Like, you know what I'm saying? We got love for folks pretty much from all over the Bay. But anyway, I came up in San Jose and that's important in my foundation because the things that I was exposed to, the communities that I was exposed to, especially the community and the political work that was happening, that left a major, major impression. So the homies that I know that I shouted out that joined, I know them from, from basketball because athletics, you know, just getting down like that with teams and sports was a major part of, you know, who I am and who I was when I was younger. But I also had a lot of black leaders and, you know, leaders from other communities that were involved in a lot of the political work and the, like the revolutionary work of the sixties and the seventies. And that stuff always stood out to me. So like I had a personality that was being formed while I was being 
encouraged to truly stand up for my people and know that it's important to push the, the fight for the freedom and liberation of black people and all oppressed communities forward, as well as exploring my creativity as a, as a lyricist and as an MC, and then also, you know, pushing the physical limits of my body as far as I could. But then, you know, as I got older, I started teaching, organizing in community more. And in 2015, I had the idea for what eventually was going to become my book, Black Boy Poems. And when that book came out, I knew that I had something that was going to allow me to take all those other aspects of my work and my personality and put it in the community in a new way that was truly going to harness the power of everything that my elders and folks in my community had poured into me to push the agenda forward for my folks, for my community, freedom and liberation movements, organizing, all of that. And so since October 15, 2016, when the book came out, we just continue to uh, evolve in what we do. And I'm currently driving on my way to a school. I'm driving to Fremont right now. We're getting ready to run one of our programs, a program that we have called BLACK, which stands for Building Leaders and Activists with Collective Knowledge. We're going to be running that at American High School for the Black students there, and it's about to be phenomenal. March is in our curriculum. We do Revolutionary Black Women for Black uh, for Women's History Month, and it's about to be amazing. So that's why I'm in the car. So y'all got to forgive me for not being able to look at the camera, but you know I'm trying to be safe while I'm navigating. I'm on 580 right now, about to hit the hop on 880 and head down to the South Bay and hit Fremont so I can be at American High School. But yeah, I hope that speaks a little bit to that question. Yes, yes. Please uh, be safe and we appreciate you taking the time to join with us. Um, and I definitely want to share the work that you're doing with schools uh, because I had the honor of joining your team, you know, as an artist as an organizer to help with the work dealing with anti-blackness and racism in schools and you know and, and changing the curriculum and amplifying our true history um, our cultural history but folks don't know that i've known you for many many years oh yeah it was like back in myspace days we've uh, yeah. been knowing each other but i was back then i was exploring islam and I think I noticed that you visit China and yep. we were building, you know what I mean? I'm of Chinese descent. I'm like, wow, you as an artist is traveling and, and you know, really spreading that, that message of unity. And I'm over here learning about Islam and you are a Muslim, you know? So we connected on shared values. So my question is, you know, what has, like, how has the culture of the Bay Area, Oakland, how, is, how has that inspired your work specifically on how it, you know, helped you build your team for FSBI? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, for real. If, uh, if I wasn't from the Bay in the ways that I'm from the Bay, having deep roots in San Jose, having strong connections and ties to Oakland and San Francisco and East Palo Alto, Richmond, all the different areas where, you know, black community has been very strong. And then all the spaces in between, you feel me? You know, Peters, Fremont, like what we getting ready to hit, Hayward, San Leandro, you know, all of that stuff, right? If I wasn't from here, I wouldn't be doing the work that I'm doing the way that I do it. So like coming up in the way that I did, I was surrounded by so much diversity in terms of thought, community experience. Like from the neighborhood I'm from, in East San Jose I'm from, uh, like story and capital stuff. So for those that know San Jose, you might know that, that intersection. And I grew up in a predominantly Mexican neighborhood, like Mexican American neighborhood. So you know, I had a whole bunch of the homies that was just a part of the experience. I, I learned a lot of Spanish because of the neighborhood that I grew up in. And then about maybe a 15 minute walk from like my front door, I would be in the neighborhood where Cesar Chavez, who was the founder of the United Farm Workers, where he lived at when he lived in San Jose. So there's a strong political cultural element. And then as I was coming up, a whole bunch of Filipino families, you know, was there. Vietnamese families, families from India popped up. You know, I'm seeing cats walking around with the turbans on. So the Sikhs are, are pulling up. Like there was so much diversity as folks from Thailand and like all over the world. And of course you had the East Africans, the Ethiopians, the Eritreans, like just to be able to 
freestyle that off the top of my head. We saw so much and had a chance to learn about so many people. So it was no, it's not a strange thing to be in community and to actually learn from and build with people who come from different backgrounds. And then because of music, like the, the tradition of independent hip hop is something that has been mastered, I would say out here in the Bay Area and the way that it's been performed from the 80s till now. So like we was following cats who was doing independent dope hip hop and we was just following the examples of selling music out of the trunk, making our own tapes, making our own CDs, being able to put on our own shows and do tours and travel throughout the states and beyond. So then we got a chance to see more of the United States and then to get out the country and do international work. That was just a whole nother way of just broadening our minds and our cultural understanding. And then with Islam also as an input, uh, you get a chance to learn about people from so many different parts of the world because Islam is such a, a huge global religious tradition or religious experience. So yeah, like all of those, I would say foundational elements help shape what I do and just make me comfortable with, okay, I'm who I am. I can learn about other folks. And not only can I learn about other folks, I can, I can actually build with other folks, but I, what I think is really important in that is a lot of the building with other folks that we did and still do. Like just because somebody from a different community don't mean that we gonna click. Like if you don't, if you not, if you don't have a right principled philosophy or approach to how you see the world and how you want to do community work, it ain't gonna rock. Mm -hmm. So we connecting with you when you still awesome disrespecting black folks black culture the black community nah fam we ain't cool but you know usually what happens in the way that we've been connecting and organizing you align with folks that come from different backgrounds and they understand now nah, we ain't gonna be perpetuating white supremacist type racism and all of that stuff like they get it now nah, we need to be about uplifting and empowering black folks following a black agenda and then we get in and we support y'all how we can support y'all but that's that was something that was modeled for us by our elders and then for us in the way that we came up like the the community that we were part of i think it was a lot easier for us to practice that because we saw so much diversity around us and many of us from different community backgrounds understood now we ain't gonna be doing that that ridiculousness that white racism type stuff we ain't moving that way so that made it easier to actually really build with communities and do solid work in those communities and that's the type of stuff that we do now. Like we get a chance to bring that information to the schools, to communities, and challenge folks to really be about changing this culture, changing these systems and these institutions in the ways that it needs to be changed. So everybody, especially Black folks, benefit from what we have here. Mm. Mm. And, and, you know, even the way that we connected and build over these years, over these shared values and these principles and i think that's why it felt like you know it cultivates everlasting relationships you of know course. i'm so grateful to be uh contributing and helping with fsmei um and talking about relationships i think in the last episode Reverend Beverly talked about the importance of unity of faith communities um how has faith you know being was principles of Islam inspire your work? I appreciate it. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a big part. So like I came up, I came up in a household where we didn't really have a religious identity. If I was to consider something a religious identity for us, it was just blackness and like more specifically political and like revolutionary blackness. So we didn't have a church home. We didn't have a, a mosque or a temple or anything like that that we went to regularly. We just, my, I have an older sister, so her and I, we were thoroughly exposed to all aspects of black history, culture, and tradition, and more so the revolutionary black tradition. So that was like my foundational spiritual practice. But through that, a person who I was taught about and was truly impressed by was El Hajj Malik El Shabazz, Malcolm X. And the, the version that I learned about the most was Malcolm. When Malcolm was a member of the Nation of Islam. So shout out to our brothers and sisters from the nation who might be um, following along on our, our talk right now because the expression of black spirituality, the way that it was 
exemplified by brothers and sisters in the nation in the 50s, in the 60s, moving into the 70s. That's what opened me up to be like, hey, wait, hold up. Like, you can, you, you can be about your people and you can have a spiritual tradition and, you know what I'm saying, like, really be on point like that. And, you know what I'm saying, like, be out That's here representing in the community the the right way, the way that I understood it as a as a young man. I'm like, I like that. I need that. Like whatever it was that made Malcolm that, I want to have some of that in my life too. And as a kid, this is nine, ten, eleven years old. I'm I'm thinking it was because of his spiritual practice. So that's what opened me up to Islam. And I remember like the first time that I began studying the Islamic tradition and it connected me to the birth of the Islamic movement in Arabia with the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. I was like, oh wait, you know, this is, oh, there's more to the story. Cause the way that it came to me and opened me up to it was the practice by black folks and the way that they demonstrated Islam through the nation. But you know, I went deeper into my study and my, my exploration of it. And it was something that I wanted to make a part of me some of the homies know me from back in the day, like around the age of 10 or 11. I remember telling my family, I'm like, I don't eat pork anymore. I started referring to the higher power as Allah and, you know, begin to incorporate some of the things that I understood as part of the practice of a Muslim into my life. And then eventually just went all the way in with that. And that was that's a journey that opened up so much more of the world for me and I feel like I've benefited, benefited greatly from it. But in the present moment, what I would say is that in terms of my work, it definitely is something that helps inspire and help keep me grounded. But the most important thing is being connected to the people. So if you have a strong connection to your people and you have some type of spiritual grounding at the same time i think that's something that can keep you balanced motivated and keep you hopefully healthy and well as you do this work in the wilderness of north america where we're at trying to navigate this place yes yes absolutely and you know thank you for your greetings to the brothers and sisters of nation of islam you know as folks may know i am of chinese descent uh, but I definitely agree with your sentiment as far as noticing this this movement where, wait a minute, you could be about your people, but there is, is you know, working in the community, but there's a spiritual aspect of it that oh, really sure. it with me. So, you know, again, for myself, I'm working in the community. I'm a proud Chinese Muslim and I work in solidarity with other you know, diverse communities. And the, the, the core of that is my studies and the teachings of the Nation of Islam and just being a Muslim. So thank you for that, um, Tyson. You know, this is the month of Ramadan. And, you know, while we're fasting and you know, we're in the holy month of Ramadan, I'm, I'm thinking about our Palestinian brothers and sisters. And I think of unity right now. That's what comes to mind. Um, what can we do here in our community with all, all that's going on in Palestine? Do you have any thoughts on what we can do right now in our own spaces with our folks in the community to bring about Yeah, community? I definitely do. Like we, we need to, tools like what we're using right now, this is super convenient based on the technology right and being in the bay area silicon valley a lot of the stuff that we're using is developed here but like we got to be able to connect with each other in real time digital spaces are important and we need to use those strategically but we need to be able to connect with each other and then not only that right we also need to be clear on and this isn't some type of hierarchy in terms of who has power in our communities but we need to be clear on what we're doing you feel me like unity for the sake of unity there's some benefit in that but unity for what purpose and there's real work for us to do and in that there's people that you got to listen to and you got to follow and so we in 2024 if that's the calendar that we want to use 
in a country that refers to itself as the United States, a country that has tried to dehumanize and victimize black people for hundreds and hundreds of years. The folks that when we gather and we unify, we need to be following black leadership, real black leadership, you know what I'm saying? Because if we're trying to deal with the real problems that we face in our society, you need to be dealing with the people who have been pushing the line, really coming up with real strategies, programs, practices, movements that have been changing the systemic, the institutional and the cultural realities that are here. Sometimes now, especially because of social media, you get somebody who might be real popular online and get a whole bunch of followers and likes and all that. And you think that person from whatever community background should be somebody that's a voice of the people. You ain't a voice of the people, you feel me? Mm -hmm. No, nah, there, there's a real formula for how this work is done. And that's why I think the example of the nation is such a strong and powerful example. And no movement, no community is perfect. We're not perfect as a people, so that's not an expectation that we should have. But in the, the, the formation and in the articulation of the nation of Islam, you have a strong, unified community of folks who believe in a common ideal. You have clear leadership and you have leadership that is speaking to the experience of the people, especially black folks. And people follow that example. They learn, they benefit from that leadership and they benefit from that example. I think that's really, really important. If we were going to highlight other movements, if we wanted to step outside of Islam, you want to look at the civil rights movement, you want to look at black power movement, you want to look at other movements like that, same thing, strong black radical leadership that speaks to the black experience. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes now when we get into these unified spaces, and this is not me trying to hate or be critical of this term right now, but I'm going to use it as an example, like there's the BIPOC conversation. All right, sometimes when we have unified spaces, it waters all of that stuff down and we don't have the right ideas, the right type of leadership, the right spirit that's guiding that unified space. Mm. So if we come together, let's come together in real time, not just in digital spaces. And then let's also come together in a way where we know, oh, no, nah, we, we really need to listen to and follow a specific type of leadership. And we're not going to be successful in any work that we do here in the United States and globally if you're not listening to authentic indigenous, indigenous as in black folks who have been here for a long time and have been navigating this wilderness, you feel me? If we're not listening and following the leadership of those types of black folk. If we were having this conversation in another country, it would be a different conversation. Mm -hmm. Who should be the leadership there? But since we're having this conversation here in the United States, native and indigenous people, of course, we need to be tapped in with them and we need to be following them because this is their land that all of us are on. And then you need to be listening to authentic black leadership. Mm. Yeah, you know, as you're as you're sharing that, you know, and as far as like leadership and guidance that comes to mind, and we need that on the community level, we need that even like like you say, we're going to different countries, it's a it's a different type of leadership. But like even in the work that you and I both do in the schools, we're navigating through that kind of dynamic too, right? Mm -hmm. Teachers and parents, um, the staff, like trying to get everyone on board with, you know, with with understanding and, and following the guidance of how to deal with anti-blackness and dealing with racism in schools and education is so important. What are the things that you have learned or pick up in the education uh, field um, that can help with unity on a bigger scale? Right on, yeah, it's, it's the same. Like you, you mentioned some of the work that we do. All right, so Amina was talking about some work that her and I do with some of our other comrades and colleagues in a lot of the schools throughout the Bay Area and beyond. And so some of our school and our school district partners, they ask us to come in and do like anti-racist curriculum and programming. And when we do that, so using the last comment that I made as a springboard into this one, you can't do anti-racist work. You can't do anti-black work, like com combating the anti-blackness that's happening in these schools and in these school districts without following black people. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, it just don't make no sense. Like, how are you, how you going to try to solve a problem 
that is completely focused on the dehumanization of black people without listening to black people saying this is how this problem needs to be solved it don't make no sense mm -hmm. so there's that so we definitely have that and then we have folks who such as you amina folks from other communities as well who are part of it because when we go into these schools you have different demographics you might have students who come from many different parts of the asian world different parts of the african world different parts of europe different parts of central america wh wherever our folks might be from that show up in these schools it's important for people to be able to learn from folks that represent those historical social and cultural experiences too so when we show up like we might have a team where we got eight or nine people and each one of us represents a different part of the globe and a different history and a different cultural experience that's important because as black folks we can't just be the ones who are talking and teaching everybody we have a role to play and we will definitely play that role but then it requires folks who understand the histories the cultures the nuances of those cultural experiences to also be a part of it and to be speaking to their people and teaching their people and being an example for their people on how we move and how we do different and we've been able to create a team where i miss mean, beautiful like looking at the brothers and sisters of the folks that we have on our squad who are a part of this work who understand it who are sincere in their work and sincere in their commitment to their people and also sincere in their commitment to eliminating and dismantling these poisonous institutions that have been affecting folks for hundreds and hundreds of years. And so with that understanding, we clicked up, we go into those spots and we do amazing work and we're going to continue to do that work together and hopefully be an example to the young folks who are coming up after us and to other communities right now. Like this is what it looks like. This is what it takes in order for us to really do this work in a sincere, committed way. Absolutely. And, you know, and how you just kind of broke that down as far as, you know, just having people on your team that could be bridge builders, you know, that represent, mm -hmm. you know, certain aspects aspects of you know the unity work and you know can connect culturally that really reminds me of the layout the format and the program of the nation of islam that you know includes what we call original family folks that come in and represent different parts of the communities of the wilderness of north america and you know a lot in the media right now we talk about just the negative aspects of young folks you know uh the, the crimes that are going up you know young people that are doing it but you are actually going at it directly through the education field um i'm wondering what resources do you need to help you with this work? what policies can be created that can help you uh, to continue the longevity of your your program and your work nah, that's a great question the greatest resource is the people because the power is always in the people. And so with that, people who are willing, people who are committed, people who are, you know, of, who, who want to be involved in this work moving forward. And then of course, like you can't, you can't um, support or continue to move in an organized fashion without having financial resources. The majority of our work that we do, like I'm, I'm pulling into a school parking lot right now, we have a, a contract with this school district. And so we get our work taken care of in that way. But we can't just be dependent on the dollars of, you know, these institutions. There are other things that we can do with financial resources to expand our work and the work needs to expand. And so if folks are interested in the work that I'm doing, it's easy. You can go to our website, FSMEI, which stands for Freedom Soul Media Education Initiatives, and you know, find out ways that you can support the, the incredible programming that we have going on. And there's so much more that we're doing. So we do, we really focus on, and for cats that know me, like I, I don't, I'm on social media, but I'm not really on social media in ways where it's like, oh, there's folks who are content creators and people who uh, identify themselves as influencers and you know, put out a whole bunch of content. My focus has always been, let's do the work and let's be in there and be in the community with the folks. So every day of the week, we're pulling up at schools. We're in the community working directly with folks. Some of that stuff we get a chance to share online, but you know, it is what it is. But the real impact being with the people that's happening every single day.
and there's so much more for us to do but like it takes the power of the people to do that and then it also takes financial resources to continue to expand on the people with the mindset that people with the right thoughts and ideas and their goals who are to the community and want to be a part of this work and then it's financial resources in order to support, sustain, and expand this work because this type of stuff needs to be happening. And I'll just add something else real quick. Like what I'm getting ready to do. So we'll be starting this program here at this school in a few minutes. Uh, give the name again. So it's the Black Program, Building Leaders and Activists with Collective Knowledge. This is a program that needs to be in every single school throughout the state of California and throughout this country and other type of programs like this because Students don't have an opportunity. Many students, especially black students, don't have an opportunity to learn about their history, their culture, their tradition themselves from the perspective of themselves. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's important. Learning about who you are from your people as opposed to learning about who you are from the perspective of a white supremacist, colonial, imperial, racist society that's tried to dehumanize and victimize your people for hundreds and hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. The message is different coming from them as opposed to coming from your community, especially when your community really knows who they are. That's the whole idea of a knowledge of self. So this type of stuff and other programming that we have needs to be everywhere, but we're still dealing with institutional gatekeepers. Thankfully, the people who we partner with they're brave enough and they're bold enough to be like, nah, we're going to let these people come in here and do everything. And that's what we do. We out here and we rock it every day. And because we've been successful thus far, that allows us to have more momentum, to knock down more doors and occupy more space and more schools and more school districts and more communities and bring this type of information, this type of programming to the people because the people want it. The young people, especially, they're requesting this stuff. And when we pull up, versions of themselves. Oh, and you come from my same cultural background and historical experience, but you doing this? Okay. And then somebody else is going to see somebody else that comes from their cultural background doing that. We need that. And so resources, people, money, and then folks who are really about that work. And let's go. Let's be out here and let's do it. And let's not be afraid to do this work. That's right. That's right. You know, a lot of people talk about, oh, we don't have our history, our, edu our education needs to be changed or needs to be reformed. But man, credit to you for just doing it. That's what I'm thinking. You just went out and just did it, you know? Oh, yeah. About all the obstacles and the challenges and all oh, these are powerful institutions. But with a few folks that are dedicated and is sincere and, you know, you just did it. And it's just been growing over the years. I bear witness. It's been growing and growing. Your team is growing. I see the impact that it's making in the school districts with the staff to the parents, the conversation that we're having. I mean, it's powerful, powerful work. Um, so I know that you're about to uh, go into another workshop. I don't want to hold up much of any more of your time, but for listening, if you have any questions for Tyson Amir, please comment, um, or just any comments, please um, type it in the chat. Uh, I always ask this at the end of the episode to all my guests. If we were to unveil love, right? Unveiling is the removal of a veil, uh, a work of art as part of a public ceremony, uh, presentation, um, some, showing something for the first time in public. Right. If we was to take off the veil of love, what would that look like? What mm -hmm. does it have right now in this very present moment? Deep question. For me, my the the immediate thing that pops up in my mind goes back to the political and the revolutionary training that I received as a as a child and something that we were raised up on is the idea that revolutionaries are revolutionaries because they love themselves and they love their people. So like from our connections to the Black Panther Party, uh, elders from the party would, would quote Che Guevara and they would talk about how he said that revolutionaries are guided by deep sense or deep sentiments of love for their people. So I think if we're, if we're being honest and we're unveiling 
You feel me? Like being vulnerable and being truthful in what it means to say, I love myself and I love my people. We move differently. We move with a revolutionary mindset in a day and time when there's clear injustice, oppression, and victimization happening across the board. We're not going to be comfortable when we're seeing these things happen. And the uncomfortability is going to move us to action because I love myself, I love my family, I love my people. I'm not going to stand for this. And I'm not just going to go to social media and post something. That is an action. So that's not me trying to hate on that, but it requires, we got to move in the real world as well as the digital world. You know what I'm saying? And for me, when I hear that, unveiling love, and if people are really like, I love myself, I love my people, I love my family, I love my community, you're going to move different. You're going to have a different understanding. You're going to have a different focus to your actions, and your actions are going to be directed on changing, dismantling, destroying the systems that are causing the problems that we see on our planet today. And that's going to change things here in the States. It's going to change things globally. We talked about our brothers and sisters in Palestine right now. All of that, fam. If you really love, then you're going to move different. If not, that's right. then we're going to make ourselves comfortable with this madness that we see around us. Right, right. right. The work within ourselves, right? The self-improvement and then the work out there backed by real actions moving in the community for our people. The love for ourselves, the love for others. Yeah. Thank you. I cannot even express that even better. Thank you so much for your time, Tyson Amir. And I look forward to continuing to do this work with you in the schools and in other forms of love. I appreciate you, Ramadan Mubarak. Ramadan Kareem. And assalamu alaikum to all the brothers and sisters out there. A couple folks gave me salam, so wa alaikum salam to y'all. But Ramadan Mubarak to the folks out there. Peace, love. Greetings to everyone else who joined at whatever time that they joined. It's good to see some of the names on here, the community. That's what we do, y'all. We're here for our people. We keep pushing for our people. And let's let's be sincere. And let's let that true love in ourselves and for our people really shine and guide our actions. That's right. That's right. Thank you. May Allah bless you and your family, Tyson. Everyone be safe. And then please follow our Instagram and look forward to more episodes and guests coming up. Have a blessed day, Tyson. Everyone have a safe day. Salaam alaikum. Salaam.